if you're depressed, for example, yeah. I've been through this in my life. I had 12 months of really deep depression once mm-hmm. for various reasons. And again, it was like an initiation. It was me mm-hmm. having to let go of stuff and walk through the fire and transform again. And it was burning off, purging off all this stuff about me, which I had to let go of. It was so uncomfortable. Yeah. And it was the gripping that I was doing that, that was causing my depression, I believe. Mm-hmm. And I can't even identify with that feeling now. It's just so long gone. Mm-hmm. But in that moment, it's not easy to mm-hmm. to say, oh, everything's perfect. Let me just trust life a little more. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not easy. Yeah. It's not easy. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's just nice to give the listeners permission to just be okay with wherever they're at and to be okay mm-hmm. with whatever they're feeling right now because whether it's joy, elation, love, bliss, or struggle, desperation, depression, anxiety, whatever it is that yes. someone's feeling right now, it's actually okay. Welcome to the Inspired Evolution, and it is a treat. Ladies and gentlemen, plants of all types and sizes and sorts, welcome to this conversation with Nick Broadhurst. Nick, brother, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. We had to reschedule my last interview because I was down and out with some gastro, which was seriously fun. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but apart yeah. from that, I'm I'm doing great. Really amazing. Thank you. Mm, so glad to hear it. For those tuning in to Nick for the first time, look, high level, looking from the outside in, you will see singer, you will see songwriter, you will see podcaster, you will even see educator. What you may not see under all those weeds is what I'm just going to affectionately call him as is like a wellness polymath. <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> um, it's yeah, like if you, it's like the flowers that you see at the top is like singer, songwriter, podcaster, educator, but really in the soil of it all is this wellness polymath that um, is just, yeah, like following your work, man, there is just so much to the multidimensionality of the work that I tune into and like just your interest and curiosities, the way they peak in all these different ways at the heart of it's always got this wellness sort of current at in its yeah flowing through it um but it's just it keeps everything so interesting and it keeps everything so fresh and dynamic and I think for me personally it speaks a lot about just the dynamic nature of health as well, just how mm. when I'm following along with your work, just how it of like health can be such an ever evolving, ever evolving terrain and stuff as well. I just want to touch base. Let's start at ground zero, man. How did like what became the impetus, the driver for wellness being such a central focus point in your life, Brother Ben? Yeah, so I think it's interesting because you said that at the heart of it is this sort of stream of wellness and mm you know, that classic saying, you teach what you most need to learn. Mm. And for me, it came about because I really lost my health in a really big way and um, totally unexpected. You know, it was Mm. a period in my life where I was definitely living, how would you say it? Certainly not my truth, but it was at that point in time, I was doing my best, right? Mm. We're always doing our best Mm -hmm. with what we have at that point in time. But I was going through a divorce um, with my first marriage and I had a little um, son who was three years old and Mm. uh, we were renovating a a house at the time, which was over a hundred years old. And, you know, back then there was really very little information about mold, right? Mm. And you know where this story is going. Yeah, I can um, see it already. Writing yeah, not on the already. wall, in the wall. <laughs> it's in the wall, totally. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> I thought, okay, look, it smells a bit musty, whatever. I'll get in there and pull some things out. And we had the builders come in and we did a lot of work and remediated a lot of this mold challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately, during that process, I was getting completely smashed by really toxic, very, very old black mold. Mm. And I just didn't know about it. And I sort of limped along for a while, Mm -hmm. starting to feel like, oh, things aren't quite right. You know, I'm getting a bit sinusy and, you know, I'm waking up a bit sore and, you know, it just didn't feel great. And I was still, even though we'd renovated, I was still living in this house 
mm-hmm. which had the remnants of that problem. Mm-hmm. And so I had this constant exposure to it. And I remember so vividly, I was watching, I mean, this is different back then. It was probably like 10 o'clock at night watching a movie, which I would never do now, right? Mm. <laughs> um, I'm like, I'm in bed at 7.30 now, but I was watching a movie and I started getting this headache. And actually not true. I'd, I'd had the headache for a few days actually mm. at that point. And I wasn't one, even back then, I wasn't one to take painkillers or anything like that. Mm. So I just kind of was pushing through, but I'd never get headaches. And it, it'd been like three days of this headache. I'm thinking, what is going on? You know, it's really mm. weird. I'm watching this movie and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. Then my eyesight starts going and I start thinking, maybe I'm getting a migraine, you know, because I'd never mm. I'd never had one before. I didn't know what it was like. So I kept just sort of getting through this movie and I got to a point where I thought, Man, something's not right, you know. So I went to bed and I quickly called my parents and woke them up. I said, hey, look, I feel like something's off here. Mm. Something's not quite right. I'm just yeah. putting you on alert in case I need some advice through the night. Mm. And at the time, my little boy was struggling with asthma. So I really didn't want to wake him up. And of course, asthma, molds, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I got to about midnight and dead set thought, this is it. Like, I'm, I'm done. I'm going to die. That's how I felt. It was so excruciatingly painful. And I didn't want to wake up my son. So I just ordered a taxi. There was no Ubers back then. Ordered a taxi. And it was the most painful 10-minute taxi ride of my life getting to the hospital. And I was in the hospital in the emergency room. And I was dressed in Adidas track pants, like a hoodie and Ugg boots, right? Mm. Now... This part of town in Sydney at the time, there's a lot of addicts, a lot of junkies in that area. Mm. And so they just assumed with the way I was behaving that I was high. I was on drugs. Mm. So they kind of ignored me. And I kept telling them, guys, you don't understand. Like I have a wife and, and child at home. Like I'm in serious pain. I'm, I don't know what's going on. And I waited two hours in the emergency room. Before you even got sworn. Jesus. Yeah, didn't get seen. Then I woke up four or five hours later in intensive care. So I had passed out in an in, in emergency and woke up in intensive care. And I had everything strapped to me. I had about 15 people in the room when I, when I opened my eyes. Yeah. And they told me, this, this doctor whispered in my ear because everything was so painful. Every sound, every piece of light that had things in my ears, things oh. covering my eyes. They said, oh, we think you've had a brain hemorrhage. And I said to them, you know, is that serious? And they said, well, yeah, it could be fatal, which is not what you want to hear, right? That's not what you want to hear when you just woke up. <laughs> right. <laughs> when you got 15 people in the room and you're getting told that it could be fatal. And anyway, we went through a whole series of scans and it turned out to be meningitis. Right. So ultimately what had happened was the mold had really shut down my immune system and this dormant, probably Epstein-Barr, something like that, had just taken over my entire central nervous system and... And my brain swelled up and there was no space really Jesus. left in my skull. So that to me started a very, very painful recovery. Yeah. And the recovery, I thought, you know, you know, you come out of hospital, they say, I was in there for two weeks. They tell you, oh, look, you know, you'd be back on your feet in the next few weeks. Mm. No education about what I had just gone through. So I found myself about two months later separated from my wife at the time and single single dad and living on my own full-on bachelor thinking oh i'm just gonna go and get ripped you know because i'm single and (laughs) yeah yeah i need to go and get ripped so i went and started doing all this workout and punished my body with terrible protein powders working out and then about six months later my body just gave up and i was bedridden for about three years so it was uh, it was a really big catalyst for initiation the by the sounds yeah. of things. Yeah, I had to walk through yeah. the fire and and find who I was in that, and um, the hardest thing, but the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm. Why did you say that? <laughs> <laughs> Why did you say that just there? Why did you say it was the hardest thing, but the best thing that ever happened to you? Well, because. I had come from a very successful musical career. 
mm-hmm. in a in a group called Sneaky Sound System, where we'd had a number one album and multiple ARIA mm-hmm. awards, and and you know touring around the world and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And I left that. I was very much the baby of the group. I didn't have as much input as I wanted. Um, and I wasn't feeling super satisfied. I had a son at home that I was away from. Mm. I decided to leave and I went into real estate. Mm. And I did very well in real estate. In in four years, I went from like zero to being awarded the top agent in the country. And Whoa. so it was a very fast sort of career. Mm. But I was off track. Real yeah. estate was never my truth i mean it served a purpose at the time Mm. of course i had to take care of my family had mortgages all that sort of stuff Mm. but i was off track and this nudged me back (laughs) to where where i ultimately wanted to be which was in music and Mm. of course opened up this as you said this wellness polymath route yeah (laughs) (laughs) i had i had to figure it out for myself and i've had some amazing physicians along the way Mm. Um, but ultimately had to figure out a lot of stuff for myself and, and it was a deep dive into not just wellness, but into consciousness, into spirituality, Mm. into divine order, masculine, family, feminine, whatever you want to call it, all these sorts of things, which govern us, which I was not aware of and led me to being with my wife. And I would never have found her, I think, if I had not gone through that process. And I can't imagine a life without her and a life without my now little 11 month old daughter. Yeah, <laughs> I've got a little seven month old at home. <laughs> and I just, yeah. right there with you, it's like all the joy in the world. I oh, love the best. that. Don't you? The best. Incredible. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that, man. Because, um, yeah, even just me expressing gratitude feels so surface compared to the depths of what you've just shared. And I just don't really know what else to sort of say to sort of. Um, yeah, reflect back the depth of what you shared. But one of the key things that I um, I find bleeding in like sort of the heart of what I what I am here to sort of share with people in regards to inspired evolution is this really. It's like an offbeat kind of conversation, but really I feel like it's fingers right on the pulse, and it's what you've just alluded to is, you know, the off track thing that you just mentioned, you know, and how you went, you know, I wasn't aligned to my truth and my health gave out to align me back to my truth. And the message that, you know, every time someone asks me, is like, what's, you know, anything else to sort of say? And I'm just like, yeah, your health is your purpose and your purpose is your health. You know, the world here sees Amrit as this purpose coach and sure, you know, but in my heart, I feel like a wellness coach. It's like, I'm a health coach, (laughs) you know, I just care about your state of being and it just so happens that you're your best self most vibrant self vital self when you're on purpose and you mentioned yeah just the way you said it like alignment to your truth and then that that dance between truth and health and it's interesting because i feel this kinship to you in terms of it's like a spiritual truth rather than a palpable mental truth that you can carry Mm. Do you agree, like your thoughts on that and unpacking that a little bit in terms of spirituality, truth and health and the dance between the three there? I think it's very easy when you go through any sort of health challenge to be to become very focused on the physical. Mm. Yet at the heart of that journey is the spiritual. Mm. And ultimately, that is where the magic lies. Now, of course, we have a physical body. We are three-dimensional beings. We need to take care of that physical body. Mm-hmm. But that's just part of it. And mm-hmm. for a time there, I was lacking a bit of that spiritual. Having said that, what was interesting was just before this whole, I guess, catalyst was I started doing Vedic meditation. Mm. So I don't know whether that was responsible for the you know, drastic shift in, in, in my life. But, you know, you can't sort of overlook that as a potential force mm. for change. Because what I found with Vedic meditation, and this is um, a technique which is also taught as transcendental meditation. They come from the same teacher, Maharishi mm. Mahesh Yogi. Mm. Um, and what I found with that technique was that it's very subtle when you start doing it. But, and it can be profound for some people. For me, it was more about getting deep rest and letting go of stress. But um, you notice 
a month, a month later, six months later, 12 months later, that your life has gradually taken little tiny micro changes along the way to the point where you're now a very, very different person. And that had happened with me in that marriage. I was becoming a very different person. And I think the universe came along and just took a sledgehammer and ended that very abruptly mm. and kind of said, look, Nick, you know, wake up. You think you're invincible. You're not. Mm. And took away. I always felt invincible. I always felt physically really strong. And, and it took that from me. And my biggest journey even today is to sometimes get caught up in the wellness, in the physical, forgetting that the goal lies in the spiritual. And what I love about that meditation technique for me personally is, and it's taken me a while to fully understand this, and it comes with time, I think, but we have to find a way every day to experience ourselves beyond thought. Mm. Because that is our essence that's that's who we are mm. we're not actually our thoughts we are we are beyond that and what i love about this technique is that it takes you beyond thought now that doesn't mean you sit there in some perfect zen state and you don't have any thoughts that's far from it it's more reps <laughs> than you can handle going thought no thought, thought let it go thought, totally let it, go. <laughs> it is it yeah. is and also yeah. what i loved about it was being was being told by my teacher thoughts are a sign you're doing it right and i was like oh thank gosh for that you know because because so often we feel like in meditation we have to achieve some state of instant nirvana where there's no thoughts empty vesselness i wish <laughs> empty vesselness yeah and it's you have those moments right definitely yeah but a lot of it's not that at all it's mm. it's that constant dance between the two and mm -hmm. But it's when you experience that and there's this beautiful, I was listening to a podcast recently with Tom Knowles mm. and. Oh, dude, how good is, oh, dude, I love you love Tom Knowles. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, it's so good. Yeah, the Vedic worldview for those tuning in, epic podcast, please do check it out. Yeah, please, so sorry, good. I interrupted just because I'm no, a fanboy. No, no, <laughs> I, I love the enthusiasm and how much you like that podcast. Yeah. But I was just going through his episodes and, mm. you know, some things appeal to you and some things don't, but I thought, no, I'm just going to listen to everything and see what's there. Mm. And one of them was around family gatherings mm. and moving through family gatherings. And of course, family gatherings can be very challenging for a lot of people. You know, we, uh, families are a great spiritual assignment, right? Mm -hmm. And he gave the example of turning a piece of white cloth into a deep, orange colors so if you imagine uh if you imagine in india for example uh, a monk walking around in a deep burnt orange robe for example like mm. how do they get that deep burnt orange robe that color mm. well you would take a deep of sorry you'd take a piece of white cloth and you would dip it into saffron water mm. right and you leave it in there and when you take it out the piece of white cloth is is gone more orange, orange. it's certainly not deep orange but it's more orange right but then what you do is you take that and you hang it in the sun and the sun bleaches it back to almost white again. Mm. And then you take that again and you put it in and you put it back in the sun and it bleaches it almost back to white, but a tiny bit more orange this time. And you do it so much mm. that the sun, the, the, the material becomes impervious to the sun. Mm. Right? Now, he gave this example because your family... And other forces in life are the sun. Mm -hmm. And it's their job, it's their role to bleach us, to burn us, to further embed that state of beingness into our very fiber of who we are. So when we meditate mm -hmm. and we take that moment of beingness, the goal ultimately is to take that feeling, not even feeling, just take that state mm -hmm. into our waking state. And to be able to become more impervious to those sorts of forces and to recognize things like family or whether it's a, a partner who's going through a hard period of their life or, or a colleague, whatever it is, to use those things and see them as the sun and the favor they're doing us by further embedding that state of being into us. And mm. that was such a beautiful reminder for why we have a practice like meditation. And mm. really made me so much more passionate about what I was doing.
and made it less of a chore because it had become a chore for me a little bit, you know? Yeah, yeah. I love that metaphor. Um, yeah. There's this interesting thread in and around here that we're discussing is these micro changes, how oftentimes with transformation, I think, especially with like personal development as an industry, it's like, you know, it's like, go to the seminar, quit your job. <laughs> it's like, this, it's like this, it's this big, big, massive transformation expectation change thing. But it's, you know, even when I follow along on your podcast, one of the things I love wholeheartedly about it is there's never a prescription, there's always an invitation. And I can see that that's a reflection of kind of the work that, you know, you put into yourself from a spiritual aspect rather than just the health and wellness advocate in you, which I know is just like, come on, get along. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, the the it's always a, an invitation to like a like a subtle shift, like a micro change. And even as you're describing, you know, the, the way we dye the cloth, it's, you know, it's so incremental. Like it's, you know, one little step, one little step, one little step that transforms us time and time again. And we bring it back to the saffron. We bring it back to the saffron, you know, mm -hmm. trying to steep into that nature of, you know, potentially coming back to who we truly are. Um, is it, there seems to be a correlation between, I guess, that approach to wellness and also that approach to, I guess, spirituality as well, in that there are micro steps to be taken along the way. Um, but then also I find therein lies a massive challenge as well because we're always kind of looking for that, you know, big buck hunter shot sort of thing in terms of transformation for wellness and for spirituality in many ways, right? Totally. Looking for a hack or <laughs> some sort of fast track. Yeah. And... It's interesting, I started reading yesterday a book called Discipline Equals Freedom, which was yeah. written by a Navy SEAL, ex-Navy mm. SEAL. And um, it basically, I think the first sentence is, there is no hack. <laughs> like, mm. straight up, there is no hack. There is just yeah. discipline. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's another great book called The Discipline of Yoga. And again, it's all about the freedom you find through discipline. And ultimately, we weren't put in this body at this time on earth for an easy time. Mm. We were here to experience everything, right? And the journey home, whatever you want to call it, back to oneness, back to that state, which some beings have accomplished, whether it's Buddha or Jesus or Muhammad, whatever, or Krishna, whatever you want to call them. Mm. Some people do manage to attain that state while in physical form. But look at what Buddha went through to get there. Mm. You know, that was not easy for him to, to achieve that state of enlightenment. And I think we have to just acknowledge that it's not always going to be easy. Sometimes it feels amazing and super easy and very blissful. But in the polarity of that, it's going to feel very freaking hard and really uncomfortable at times too. Mm -hmm. And... That's been, I think, for me, one of the biggest lessons is letting go or, or judging the journey. Easier said than done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it depends what you're going through, right? Because if you're in a real, yeah. if you're depressed, for example, yeah. I've been through this in my life. I had 12 months of really deep depression once mm -hmm. for various reasons. And again, it was like, an initiation. It was me mm -hmm. having to let go of stuff and walk through the fire and transform again. And it was burning off, purging off all this stuff about me, which I had to let go of. It was so uncomfortable. Yeah. And it was the gripping that I was doing that, that was causing my depression, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I can't even identify with that feeling now. It's just so long gone. Mm -hmm. But in that moment, it's not easy to, mm -hmm. to say, oh, <laughs> everything's perfect. Let me just trust life a little more. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not easy. Yeah. It's not easy. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's just nice to give the listeners permission to just be okay with wherever they're at and to be okay yeah. with whatever they're feeling right now because whether it's joy, elation, love, bliss, or struggle, desperation, depression, anxiety, whatever it is that yeah. someone's feeling right now, it's actually okay to feel yeah. that way and not be too hard on yourself, to be kind to yourself because I think people are very hard on themselves. I think it's what I see in my DMs the most is just a lot of, a lot of self-criticism, you know, it's, mm. it's, um, 
I think it's a plague really, you know, mm. of humanities that because we're always comparing ourselves so much to what we see around us in terms of social media. Sorry, that's mm. my daughter. Hey, yo. She, she's usually asleep right now, but mm. she's for some reason not wanting to do that. Staring. So, <laughs> yeah. Do you um, take it with that? No, no, it's all right. It's, uh, Melissa's got her. Okay. Cool. But, uh, you know, I think just being kind to ourselves is just such an mm. important thing to do Mm. it's remarkable isn't it when you start to tune into just a simple like taking the time to recognize and i think this this is what meditation for me personally in early days was really really helpful for was just identifying the i don't want to use the word tirade but i might even go there (laughs) it's like the tirade of like just self-defeating and like self-critical thoughts that were the natural sort of flow of my head. And it was just like, boom, 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 boom. It was like, and this wasn't good enough. And you could do better with this. And and it was just like, whoa, like, I don't even like, and we hear this all the but I would never talk to you like that, Nick. Like I would never ever talk to anybody the same way with the propensity of negativity that my mind was having a crack at me at with early days. And I didn't even realize that that was happening. That was just the self-critical sort of nature of, you know, and subsequently I've, I've learned to understand that it's an evolutionary tool, like gone rampant, right? Because obviously learning from our mistakes, you know, we, we wanted to fit in socially into the tribe was just really critical part of, you know, getting along to go along um, in life. And it was a safety mechanism so that we didn't sort of fall out of line. So to be that conscientious, but to the point where, yeah, it really sort of, you know, inhibits us from in so many ways from expressing ourselves authentically to even just feeling good about ourselves as we are. It's, it's, I don't want to say toxic, but it is really full on. Um, it's such a interesting awareness to come to light to that we would speak to ourselves in a way that we wouldn't care to speak to even people that we potentially don't even know that well, let alone our like most sacred loved ones. Um, yeah, that journey that you're alluding to is is super profound, yeah, like that awareness of like the way I'm talking to myself, that self-kindness. There's so much space for that in so many uh, – there's probably still room for that um not even probably there is still so much space <laughs> for me to grow into that even now um with the awareness that i carry and i'm not on the anvil of beating myself up as hard as i was early days um yeah i i'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down there yeah if you look at my wife for example she wrote her first book mastering your mean girl which is all about that inner critic um obviously mm. uh written more for for women and it's just been such a huge success that book because everyone identifies with that voice Mm. and she gave it a name. She gave it the name of the mean girl and it's become this sort of almost cultural thing that people now use to talk Mm. about their inner critic is my mean girl says this, my mean girl says that. We have people come up to her on the street and say, oh, my mean girl was telling me not to come and say hello, blah, 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 you know. (laughs) But then, of course, her third book, Comparisonitis, uh, taps into this again in terms of how we compare ourselves. Now, she's she wrote those books but still finds herself comparing herself Mm. to other people on social media or that they're doing that better and they're growing quicker or whatever Mm. so it's just a journey Mm -hmm. it's Mm -hmm. just a journey and yeah yeah i loved how you opened the podcast at the beginning saying we teach what we need to learn you know it's it's such a it's it was almost like one of my favorite um conversations that i've ever listened to was this ramdas talk and he goes i'm completely aware that those that know don't talk (laughs) and those that talk don't know but here i am anyway talking (laughs) who starts a conversation like that ramdas you gangster (laughs) um but yeah i love that and it's interesting as well because i find with certain things like comparisonitis like it's i i find myself in my coaching saying this to my clients sometimes which is like did you even stand a chance you know it's like we feel we don't feel that great about ourselves and you know and all this stuff is happening but then like i'll go into like 
just Coles and you just walk down the supermarket aisles and there are just airbrush photos of people in even just the toothbrush section, right? Like just these brilliant white smiles, which are just not human, <laughs> you know? And they're just like pouring off you on the walls. And it's like, this is the standard of beauty you got to live up to. And it's like, did you ever stand a chance of not feeling enough? Did you ever stand a chance of not comparing yourself, you know? And because often it's like, I don't live up to that and I don't feel good that I don't live up to that. And it's like, whoa, like the programming's on really hard, man. Like, mm. Mm. You didn't even stand a chance, you know, and I know that sounds disempowering in many ways, but it's like, just be kind to yourself for a second. Just go, hey, it is what it is, what it is. And it's the world out there. And I never really stood a chance. Can I just meet myself where I'm at in that? I've just been subjugated to all of this external influence to not be enough, to need to compare, because I feel like in a capitalistic society, comparison is a, is a great trick because it helps you stay competitive. Which, you know, and is another great trick to sort of keep you trying to produce infinitely on a finite planet, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, as well, I think it's coming back to meditation, you know, what is the mm. remedy for that? What mm. is the remedy for that feeling? And, you know, not everyone looks like that person on the Colgate box, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Very few yeah. people do. Very few um, people do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. So, so what's the remedy for that? Is it going to the gym or is it going to the spiritual gym and meditating mm. and experiencing ourselves again beyond mm. thought and then going, oh, okay, that's who I am. And you wouldn't even think that's who I am because you don't think when you're in that state, but you get a feeling of that, mm. right? And I feel, I feel like that's, it's interesting. I had this conversation with a girlfriend of mine the other day. We were talking about the personal development space because a mm. lot of our friends are in that space. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, honestly, I'm so over it because yeah. there's just so much information out there mm. and there's so many experts and so many point of views. And, and it's funny, this, this woman, I won't mention names, but this woman uh, with quite a large following decided to make me the target of um, about 20 stories. And she usually mm. just targets, you know, really famous people. Usually mm. it's politicians or Novak Djokovic or someone like that. But yeah. it became me this day. And it was so intense what was said about mm. me. And she called me, which I found funny. And I actually, it didn't bother me. I actually found it really mm. amusing, the whole thing. Because mm. it was some really funny things said in there. Uh, funny from the perspective that I can't believe someone thinks that about me, which was quite interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but she called me a wellness influencer mm. and I thought to myself, gosh, really? Is that, mm. <laughs> is that how I'm coming across? Cause mm. that is not at all how I want to be perceived at all. I'm literally just Nick doing music yeah. and, and sharing my life. I'm not, mm. I don't give advice to anyone. As you said, I, I never give advice. It's always an invitation. Yeah. It's an invitation. And I think the worst yeah. thing is to give advice when there's no inquiry. You've got to wait for worthy inquiry before you say anything, really. As you said, those who know don't talk. Right. <laughs> and and it's not easy to always do, right? It's a good practice. Mm. But in that moment I was like, wow, okay. This whole personal development space is really interesting because I don't know how helpful it is anymore. <laughs> because a lot of it, what it can do is it can take us from the most simple thing available to us all. And I always bring it back to this, always. And this mm. is what my friend and I spoke about because she was talking about her business and, and what's next for her. And I just said, I'm so over it. <laughs> like I'm so, mm. I don't want to do another program. I don't want to see mm. someone else launching another 10 steps mm. to this. Mm. All we really could be doing with our voice is encouraging people to mm. experience ourselves beyond thought because that's where the true beauty lies mm. and it sounds like a broken record but but if i can leave one or maybe two things behind in this lifetime it would be my music mm. and hopefully a legacy of making or guiding people towards meditation whatever that mm. looks like for you Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, what do you think about that? Because 
the, the personal development <laughs> space. I, and this is this is why this is why I've been writing a novel. I've been writing a <laughs> novel and not writing yeah. a personal development book because. Yeah, I just felt like no one needs another personal development book, and I'm not going to critical <laughs> people who are in this space. I'm just questioning. I'm just questioning how best to show up for people. You know, I think it's completely inappropriate for you to be asking me questions on my podcast <laughs> <laughs> because I do have an opinion on this, which literally dropped in in meditation the other day. <laughs> And I have to be honest and share my two cents on it now. So you're not being inappropriate at all, by the way. It's just really <laughs> no. a creepy sense of humor, bro. Um, yeah. So what I wrote, and again, as uh, even me saying I wrote is this whole I thing and me identifying my thoughts. So what came through <laughs> was this <laughs> very interesting drop in when I was looking at my journal after. I was like, whoa. So without building it up too much um <laughs> self-improvement and being mindful of the word self in self-improvement because it can lead to self-obsession really quickly and it leads you towards potentially that self-obsession down rabbit holes that bring you closer to narcissism than certain things that like were the kind of things you were avoiding when you started your journey of self-improvement, but you didn't even know were pitfalls along the way. And you've gone on this journey of trying to improve yourself and you've become so self-invested and self-involved that self-obsession becomes this thing. And then you kind of like, so like in this echo chamber of thinking about who you are as an individual all the time. And it's like, you're basically self-obsessed and you're coming closer to this narcissism. And it's like, well, we'll take a sec, you know, to then and the antidote that sort of popped out on the other page was just, you know, from your center, you know, from your wholeness, learn to balance yourself with giving to others, you know, and an ode to community basically. Um, but it's interesting but, you say that because is it not that extreme swing towards, as you said, almost into that sort of narcissism, is it not that extreme swing that we have to experience to then come back to find the center it's often a question i ask myself in terms of because like consistently on the inspired evolution podcast i'm interviewing people's in like interesting journeys and it's like you know the extreme from like challenge to breakthrough challenge to breakthrough and i always ask this question why do we have to like swing so hard to find center i personally find and this is maybe just my projection on people um but I've witnessed enough experience of this in myself. And I'll give you an example of like, there's a, like someone will give me a compliment and I look up to them. Shouldn't have put them on a pedestal. I did. They gave me a compliment. Yeah. And they're like, that gassed me up big time. Yeah. Because I look up to them. And then the next minute, like a couple of moments later or next day or whatever, they said something that like got in, <laughs> you know, and it was like, oh, that's, Dung, bro. And then I checked myself. I was like, why did it sting? It was like, because you let them all the way in when they gassed you up so that mm. when they let you down, it hit real hard. And so realizing that actually if I was in my center, I wouldn't have needed the appraise or the, you know, and all of that to sort of say that we don't swing so hard if we're centered. And I think as we're on the journey, I think it's a telling tale for me that I've still got plenty of work to do when I'm swinging from one extreme to the next. I'm still swinging so hard. And I think life is beautiful in all the ranges that we get to experience. But I think as we walk our path, we swing less. I don't think we experience any less, but I think we swing less because we kind of know our path a little bit better. And we kind of know that, oh, yep, that's that's me swinging too hard out there and that's me swinging too hard. And it doesn't mean that I'm not experiencing life fully. It's that I'm more aware in terms of I was put here to have this experience of life. And that's mm. what the universe want to looks in on itself as through me and that I can surrender and accept that part of me more. There's plenty of challenges on that path, I think, because life has this sort of and culture and society has this sort of come do this and come do that and it's like Ugh, and it's like fomo is a real thing at times but trying to sort of just you know follow that that trajectory so i do think the swing is super present um i do think it helps us come to center again and again but i think it, it'll serve you 
a handful of times, but I think if you keep looking for the swing to sort of guide you back to centre again and again, it's. I don't think it's the healthiest model personally um, to find your centre. But perhaps if you're un, like, unaware of it, there probably is no other way um, to go super hard and then that way and that way and that way. But right. eventually after time, you'd hope you'd cultivate some awareness so you wouldn't be relying on that method. Did that answer your question? No, it does. It makes sense. And, you know, I was thinking, what is it about that industry a little bit that sort of um, has made me feel that way? I think it's probably the perception that people don't swing very much or maybe mm. that's what's being sold. And I think that's just not, this is not true because everyone swings. Mm. No one sits in their center unless you are, mm. or, you know, there's even stories of Jesus trashing a church and, you know, losing his, losing his stuff over certain things, you know? So mm. there is, maybe it's just about being real, being honest about where mm. people are at and, you know, for me personally, you know, I found myself recently kind of treating my wife in a way which was just really not nice, you know, mm. and just sort of taking a step back and going far out. Have I learned nothing, you know, mm. and then going, oh, it's okay. It's all good because I can always adjust and I can always be better. Mm. And I think that's what it is. I think that's why I felt a bit sort of um, funny with the whole industry because I feel like maybe there's that projection that everything's much more rosier than it actually it is. And well, therein, therein lies the rub, right? Because it's coupled with social media so intrinsically these days. And social media is, yeah. is you always putting your best foot forward, yeah? And it's like... it's and, Unless it's, you it's watch the, my it's stories. The, <laughs> right but it's for, for the most part but i don't say 95 yeah, yeah. percent of it is yeah, like yeah. you're just looking at people's shiny shoes right it's like the shiny shoes and it's like you don't see their broken thongs <laughs> you see their shiny shoes and for those tuning in from the states we're not talking about broken underwear we're talking about broken <laughs> slippers in yeah. australia thongs are slippers <laughs> right? yeah. um but yeah like when you do you see their shiny shoes and i think when we tune into self-improvement, it's like, well, self-improvement towards shiny shoes and they're so coupled together. But that's where, yeah, I think the blessing, touch wood, and I'm touching all the wood in the world potentially between for yourself and myself is that's where like a, like coming home to personal development, but not sort of the industry, but rather spirituality is a much safer, hallowed ground for someone like myself and I dare say someone like yourself as well. I definitely can't speak for you, but it's, yeah, it gives you permission to be kind of whole, broken and all this sort of stuff rather than tuning into like what you alluded to, like potentially an industry, which is, yeah, like more glitz and glam, which I potentially don't feel like, I feel like the industry may have grown out of spirituality in many ways, right? But then social media has then also tacked on and then pulled it a certain way as well. It's just my humble perspective on it. Um, I'm by no means an authority on the space, but... Yeah. You said something interesting about self-improvement, self-obsession. Um, all you need to do is make one tiny change to that and make the S a capital S. Mm. And you're in the right place. Tell me more about that. Well, self with a small S is us. It's the I, the me. Self mm. with a capital S is The collective, truth. yeah? Right? Uh. So if we become self with a capital S obsessed or self capital S focused on self improvement, self focus, mm. self love with a capital S, um, it's only a small little tweak to what you were saying, but it's it sets us back on the on the path of not where we Can should explain, be or need to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you explain the capital S self more? Is it the collective us self, or is it the no? Tell me more about well, what you define. Well, I think you could define it. Self. You could define it however you wanted to define it. I mean, for me personally, my capital S self is that state beyond thought. Mm. It's a state of beingness, not a state of doingness. Mm. That's my capital S. Mm. And ultimately, where I feel most of the magic lies is in tapping into that state of beingness and then being able to take that state into our waking state more and more and more as i said about the sun and the cloth yeah and so perhaps our waking st state is infused with more capital s self mm. than small s self yeah so yeah it's yeah self-love self-love with the capital s is a really good thing you know 
Yeah, it's interesting as you're identif- as you're articulating that. It's really delineating for me my yeah what you're identifying as capital L's capital S um, self is for me what I label as spirit in my life. Yeah, um, there you go. And then Perfect. lower S is what I sort of associate as yeah ego and mind. Um, Correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. Beautiful, <laughs> bro. Interesting thing that I love in this space is you've chosen and you mentioned this meditation and music two things that you know if you can leave the world with and it's like meditation and music and I feel a massive kinship there um humbled by your music by the way and uh (laughs) in love with the fact that meditation is part of your path and in um in that I just wanted to take a moment to revel with you it's like isn't it there's something to be said about those two journeys. Um, I'm sure journaling is one of those journeys as well. It's one. It's like those. You know, there's there's so many journeys which are finite. Mm. Yeah, but music, meditation, journaling. There are a couple of these things that you chance across in life where the journey is actually infinite. And initially, when you're starting out, it's almost like oh, but. You know, you listen to an Olympic musician and you're like, what's the point? Why do I even start? You know, or you, you, you know, you see a yogi like Maharishi and you're like, why do I even, yeah, that's for him, <laughs> you know. But then you sort of start on your journey and you're like, oh, but it gives me so much to be on this journey and finding myself on this path. I just wanted to revel kind of on these beautiful paths that there are that are infinite and overwhelming in their nature and their infiniteness, but so enriching in Mm. their little micro steps that we get to take along the way. Yeah. Also, I think one of the most powerful things we can do is just mother nature, right? Mm Because that's also, I mean, that feels very infinite to me. I guess it is finite to some extent, but from a, from a earth perspective, but it's infinite from a universal, universal perspective, right? (laughs) Yeah. But um, there's so many paths. And that's the thing. There's not just one path, Mm. you know, and I don't, I don't want it to sound like, Oh, I just, you know, I don't want it to sound like I've got it all together and I'm some, you know, spiritual person. Mm. I think the world needs less of that sort of stuff, you know. Mm. It's more, hey, this is me. This is what's helped. And if it resonates, you know, give it a crack. And it's interesting. Mm. I was going to be, sh- I was going to share this morning on Instagram, actually. I didn't get around to it, but just mm. again, share this app called One Giant Mind, which is, by a friend of mine, Johnny Pollard, and mm. it teaches the Vedic meditation oh, technique. We've had Johnny on. Yeah, yeah, we've had yeah, Johnny. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I was just reflecting on it because I was using that app just to bring me back into alignment with my practice a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, even though I've been taught by a teacher and I have my own mantra, etc. But I was uh-huh. using that app and I thought, what an amazing gift to humanity that one app is. Mm. Like, does the world know what they have in that little? Mm white and blue logo like do they really Mm. know yeah what's in there like it is so freaking awesome right um Mm. so i didn't lost my train of thought there but (laughs) there's a tip (laughs) download one giant mind app it's really (laughs) quite phenomenal what that can give a person it can change an entire person's everything trajectory yeah one of the things i wanted to tune in with you um about today was just the essence of sharing. Um, And like, I feel like for me, one of my friends said this to me and it was really profound because he's a massive introvert and I'm like a a massive extrovert, right? So again, labels, but nonetheless, Um, he, 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 he said to me, he knows when something's like really good when he just has that compulsion to like, I gotta share it, <laughs> you know? It's like, I wanna bring my mum along, I wanna bring my dad along, I wanna bring the dog along. <laughs> this is just like, we're getting along. This is, I gotta share this. And just that essence of sharing. And I think following your journey, um, like so much of what you're doing, like I said, is you sharing. Um, were there resistance pieces to that? Are there still resistance pieces to it today? Um, are there certain things that are okay to share, not okay to share? What inspires you to share um, so openly and so vulnerably, bro? That's a good question. I actually feel most comfortable when I'm being vulnerable. Mm. Like to me, that's just a really nice place to be is in the state. Was that always the case? Was that always the case? 
Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. It's hard mm. to say because I've I've changed so much over the years. I can't even identify who I was before. Mm. Uh, Melissa, I would say. It's really hard to identify with that person. Certainly mm. the real estate agent. I can't even... I just look at photos and I, I don't know who that person is. <laughs> yeah. You know? And someone said to me, when like, when you have that realization that the five years ago version of you is not someone that you personally want to hang out with, you start having these harrowing realizations <laughs> about yourself. And I was like, yeah, man, I can't stand the 10 years ago version of me like that guy. Oh, man, that's the guy I avoid at the party. <laughs> like, it's you, true, though. right? But I, I don't know. For me, I really enjoy that vulnerability. And yeah. um, I think music's really helped with that because when I started mm. doing my own solo music, I, I was not a singer, right? I was, you can see in the background there, there's a saxophone and some guitars. Mm. I mean, I, I was known as a sax player, which to mm. me is a form of voice, but yeah. I was not a singer. I didn't play piano. So, and then all of a sudden I'm a singer and a pianist, right? So like, <laughs> I had to start from, I had to start from zero. I couldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> well that was 2014 i started playing piano and yeah. and started singing and mm. when i started it was terrible but i had to be vulnerable with myself to, and be okay it's really funny actually benfold mm. uh he wrote this book Ooh, what is it it's his biography but i can't autobiography but i can't think the name but he said, you've got to, you've got to be okay with the brown. The brown mean, meaning like the crap, the shit, mm. <laughs> right? He said, mm. you've got to be okay. Let the river run brown until it runs clear. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, you just gave me permission to be awful and be okay with it. Because as a singer, when I, because my, my music time is generally 8.30 to 11.30 each day. Mm. Um. I, I would love to say that I'm really disciplined with that, <laughs> but, you know, mm. things come up and I find excuses at times. Mm. Um, but in the morning, your voice is cold and you just sound, well, I sound crap. I'm just not, I'm, I'm not a natural. I work with some musicians who are just, doesn't matter what time of day, they sound so good, right? Yeah. And I had to become okay with feeling crappy about, well, not crappy, but hearing myself go allowing sounds, the brown river allowing to myself burn, to yeah. feel yeah allow myself to be brown and mm. that was beautiful and i think it's allowed me to be more vulnerable with myself because mm. i have to be okay with that feeling of like oh this is not i can't release this i can't do this i can't do that and then all of a sudden you just get this moment this little moment where you're like oh my god that's beautiful mm. right and it's just it doesn't happen all the time, maybe mm. once a day or whatever. Mm. But I remember so clearly the first song I decided to release was called, it's called Little Lover. It's still my biggest song. Mm. But, but mm. I remember when I was writing it, and I've got the original voice note on my phone that I hit record because mm. I was like, I've got something here. And I was mm. on this like cheap little keyboard with a terrible set up you know just really cheap stuff but i was singing into it and i thought that's me that that is me as a musician right there i found mm. it you know i had this feeling mm. and if i hadn't have allowed myself to be awful i would never have reached that point and then i put it out and this song just took off and all of a sudden you know i'm getting these reviews about this amazing voice. I'm like, what? <laughs> You're, kidding me. You're kidding me. They're not right. They're not talking about me, surely, you know? Um, yeah. You know, like this angelic voice and this sort of stuff. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Like if you guys knew how much brown there was running through that. <laughs> <you know? laughs> but um, yeah. I, I think that's been really important. And I still, I have those moments every day, generally at the beginning of each day where I'm like, Ooh, mm. okay. And often I have inspiration in the bath with my daughter. I actually wrote a song about a month ago. Yeah. I started because she just loves dancing and I started doing this mm. beatbox. It's like, like a very specific beat. Then I had this bass line I started doing with it, like, 
boom, 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 boom. I thought that's quite yeah. cool. And she was like bopping along like crazy. And then I said, <laughs> hey, Melissa, grab my phone for me and I quickly put it as a voice note. And three days later, that song was done. And <laughs> with another artist singing it. So this has been this whole new dimension of me is mm. through the writing process of writing the Nick Broadhurst music, I started writing some of these songs that were very poppy. Mm. And not like... I don't want to use pop in a derogatory sense. I think there's amazing pop out there. But they mm. were much more pop than what Nick Broadhurst's music was. Mm. But I wanted to release it. And I released a couple and they did okay. But I was like, ah, that's going to confuse the listener. So yeah. what I've actually done is I've splintered off into a new artist project. Mm. And that project is anonymous. <laughs> mm. And so that's another whole surrender because I could use my platform to get that out there. But mm -hmm. I have to let the music do the talking with that one. Um, mm. I'll give you a hint. See if you can figure it out. Because it'll come out mm. April 26th. That's the first single coming out. Awesome. And the name is based off my initials. And my full initials are very unfortunate. They are <laughs> N-O-B. <laughs> <laughs> we could talk about this because mine's are A-S-S. <laughs> 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 I love it. That's so good. No one should Yours put us together in a podcast. <laughs> At least not our initials. <laughs> Definitely not us and knob. That is not a good combination. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 it did it did make a really cool name, and I'm gonna say it one more time. N O B. Mm. Um that's all I'm gonna mm. say. But um okay, cool. so what I've done is yeah. I've partnered up with other musicians and i'm not mm. singing on that project and it's been so liberating because all of a sudden i'm hearing <laughs> i'm hearing what i actually hear in my head because often i hear it and i sing it and it sounds different yeah because yeah, i just don't yeah. i don't do pop i do like very beautiful floating mm. um falsetto you know more pretty stuff but when it comes to pop yeah. like banging out like a hip-hop or an r&b song it's just not my thing right mm. so i've mm. teamed up with these artists and now i've got this array of artists coming on who've all worked with like Justin Bieber, Alicia Keys, mm. um, Megan Trainor, Kane Brown, um, mm. Wiz Khalifa, like really amazing, Incredible. amazing talent. Yeah, amazing, amazing mm. talent. Um, and they're singing my songs. And Yo. it's really, it's really exciting because yeah. I get to let go and just be the creative and direct and and be more of a producer and a songwriter. Mm -hmm. So that's been mm -hmm. really freeing for me. And it's allowed me to actually really find out what the Nick Broadhurst next album is because I wrote about eight of those songs, had them a long way produced. I'm working with this great producer in the States. And I had a, f a call with him a few weeks ago and I said, you know what? We're going to scrap six of those songs. Yeah. <laughs> and because I was getting clearer and clearer on what I wanted to leave behind as my mm -hmm. own, if I can be as vain to say legacy, mm -hmm. you know. But I think music's this great gift because you you take something out of thin air, this invisible thing that's like you can't Ether. see. It. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, a yeah. vibration and you capture it and you make it yeah. re repeatable. It's like the, it's yeah. alchemy, right? It's amazing. <laughs> it's yeah. full alchemy and... <laughs> And I'm much more clear on on what I want that to be now. So the Nick Broaddus mm. album is taking a lot longer than I thought. But I know it's going to be a much more true representation of me. But then you've got this other project, which is just pure fun and joy. And mm. uh, one of the songs, this might be giving it away a little bit too much in terms of anon anonymity, but one of the songs is quite explicit, but it's called mm. Fuck the Numbers. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry if I just made you put an E on your podcast but no, you're good. <laughs> um, the reason I wrote if we that lost song, that at knob and ass. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wrote that one yeah. because it's uh, it's about social media. It's about what social media is doing to society, and so mm. I've still found a way in pop to have this really strong message, which has been really been really fun. Yeah. So, I think yeah. for anyone listening to this episode, what we're talking about right now is my greatest lesson has been be okay with being not great mm. if if it gives you the space and the permission to become great to mm. find that thing that lights you up i think it's really hard you know there's a saying that you know 
well, not even a saying, but a belief, I guess, that everyone has some gift to share with the world. And I get it. Mm-hmm. But it's really hard for that person who's working as, I'm not too sure, someone who's selling something on the streets, living in a slum in Bombay or Mumbai. Mm. It's pretty challenging to to tap into what's my gift with the world. But perhaps mm. that person's gift is the smile they give when they do sell something. I'm not too sure. Mm. But my point is that it, it's a really tough thing for me to get my head around this whole idea of someone having, everyone having something to share. But I believe we do. And I think mm. a lot of that starts with just being okay with being really average and don't judge yourself. Be kind. Because I would never have released music if I judged that music the whole way along. And I did at the beginning, but then I, be- I became okay with it being average. Mm. You know, and looking for those moments of like, ooh, that's me. Mm. Um, I hope that makes sense. It totally does. It totally does. And just, yeah, I was going to ask you if, if you think it's a prerequisite um to let the brown river run and then i realized yeah you already answered that <laughs> um i think yeah, everyone has to at sure. some point but some people start a lot earlier mm. and they've got their ten thousand ten thousand hours in by the time they're 10 years old <laughs> you know yeah. and they they were too young to judge the brown because they were just mm. doing their thing and at 10 they're a violin prodigy or something you know mm. um, but that was yeah. my path i started singing when i was 30 two or something 33 like, <laughs> yeah i love that nick before i let you go i'm gonna ask you just a question about like music expression and the the mirror effect so sort of you've put music out in the world and you've had so many different types of music out in the world there's still different kinds of music coming out in the world the the reflection that it puts back to you in terms of this is what i've expressed and well what does that reflect back to me um, yeah, cause you could be at the risk of sort of, you know, in terms of the alchemy, you could be harnessing whatever you could, um, from the ether, let's call it that, but you're harnessing a particular type of frequency. Let's put it that way. Super woo woo conversation right now, but nonetheless, mm-hmm. um, yeah, the way the, what that reflects back to you potentially. Okay. So this is what's chan- being channeled through now, as opposed to, I at a different point in my life, a different thing was coming through. Do you look at it as milestones and reflect back on the music and does it give you an opportunity to look back at your own personal evolution in terms of where you're at as an individual? Um, mm. Yeah. Is that, is that mm. a thing or is, am I just being too? Well, no, to, to take it literally, yes. I mean, if I look at Little Lover, I was kind of not fantasizing, but I was really working hard on an esoteric level to mm. call in my soulmate. Mm. You know, and that song was kind of summing up everything at that time. I was feeling that I wanted in a in a partner, and didn't even know I wanted. Because it's funny, because it, even when I wrote that, I felt like, oh, I don't think I'll ever marry again. I won't have any more kids again. I feel like I'm good. You know, I feel happy. Mm. I'm I'm content with where I am in life. Um, but still, in me, there was still that desire because that song came out of me, and it helped me realize, oh. Well, if that's coming out when, because I feel like when you write something that feels really great, mm. it's it's not you doing the writing at all. Mm. Like that's not you can't. I don't think you can take any credit for any music or any art. Personally, mm-hmm. the only thing mm-hmm. you can take credit for is sitting your ass down and doing the work, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because that's really yeah, challenging but, to do. Mm-hmm. Well, it is for me. It is for me. But mm-hmm. I know that if I look at great authors like Stephen King, for example. I remember Mm. reading one of his books and he said that, I think it was him that said it, if not, it was someone else (laughs) really clever, but Mm. they said, uh, inspiration strikes every day. It just happens to strike at (laughs) 9am, you know, because they're sitting sitting down and and he had, what I don't have that I wish I had more of would be the level of discipline that people like Stephen King have, which is obviously he can just, he just pumps books out. But Mm. one thing that he does is he commits to a certain number of words every day that he writes. Mm. And if he Mm. generally writes those between like 4 and 5 p.m., Mm. even though he's been sitting there all day. Yeah, wow. Right, because there's that resistance that Stephen Pressfield talks about in The War of Art. Huge turning point in my career was reading that book, for example, but... You know, he, he, he does that. And then when he finishes a book and he says it's done, he gets more paper and he starts writing the next one. 
without even a <laughs> moment. <laughs> yeah, like, wow. Well. <laughs> not even like a beat between them, you know. And I think, yeah, I feel sometimes frustrated with that within myself that I feel like I could have been, not could have, I can still be whatever I want to be, but mm. by now I could have achieved a lot more with my music if I had that level of discipline. Mm. Um, but then just being like, it's okay. <laughs> mm. But coming back to the music, you know, there's a song called Take Me Down and that song was about that period of my life where I felt like I was getting taken down. Mm. And I can listen to that music now and I can recognize what I felt in the moment and why I loved it and why I wrote it. But I can't identify so much with the lyrics because it doesn't feel like me anymore. Yeah. So it's a reminder yeah. of where I've come from for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I hope that answers Little time capsules. It totally does. Yeah, it is. It totally it's time does. capsules, but it's not representative yeah. of particularly who I am now, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Man. <laughs> this is a, Thank you. You said you said free flowing. I hope this has been free flowing. <laughs> <laughs> one it's, way to um, one way to define it. Yeah. <laughs> well, when you've got the polymath on, it's just <laughs> Yeah. And uh yeah, I I do have a question that's burning and I feel like and I do kind of want to let you go as well, but I don't really want to let you go. But I <laughs> conscious that at some Ask. point I'm gonna have to let you go. Ask. Um yeah. podcasting as an art form bro um i personally have found it beyond enriching um mm. in my own life and if anything yeah an ode to potentially what well an ode to what you've been talking about discipline like there is the relationship i've had with my wife now which has been for me 11 and a half years um outside of that this has been pretty much you know one of the most consistent things every week a podcast has has gone out um, every week and it's just been like, and I've not that disciplined, (laughs) yeah, but it's, you know, it's kept me accountable and the things that it's like enriched and created in my life has just been, yeah, it sounds so cheesy to say it's (laughs) game-changing, but it's literally been life-changing for me. Um, Your experiences as a podcaster equally as enriching, like, (laughs) yeah, tell us a little bit about what it meant to you. Well, you know, I stopped doing my podcast because uh, I was battling with the question of do we need another podcast and who am I mm. to to share? Mm. And I, I know that the podcast has been helpful. I know, I know mm. that because I still get a lot of messages about it. My format was different because it's a solo cast. Mm. So it's just me, right? And yeah. I would generally really research those. Po- yeah. Well, they, as time went on, I researched it more and more and more and more. And it was, it was mm. taking up a lot of time. Mm-hmm. I was always really, really proud of each episode. I really felt like each episode, uh, there was a few towards the end that I really felt were, I think there was one called The, the Real Villain of the Pandemic. Mm. Um, things like that, which I felt really proud of because I'd managed to offer something that felt new and fresh that might be supportive to people Mm -hmm. Uh, but ultimately I thought my bigger gift was my music so I had Mm -hmm. to make that decision to to stop podcasting and and focus on what I felt was a bigger point of service to humanity if I can again that sounds super vain and unhumble but at the end of the day you have to at some point decide what you have to offer and and stick to that. We don't have to, but you can if you do want you to. Think it's, do you think it's that vain? Like I think one of the biggest questions we can ask ourselves is what, our, what is our greatest service to the whole and really meet ourselves in that space? Like what is our greatest service? And I know we said there aren't any hacks, but I honestly feel like that's one of the biggest hacks, mm. sort of getting out of your own way. Um, it takes work, so maybe it's not a hack, <laughs> but it's... But it's um, but it's a beautiful hack to sort of like as a question, sort of what is my greatest service to the whole? Um, and man, your music's amazing. Your conversations are amazing too. So <laughs> you could have picked either one, in my humble opinion. But like for me, I know conversation, conscious conversation like this is everything for me. And so, you yeah. know, that just kind of has been continuously guiding my path, touch wood. Mm-hmm. But I love that question. I don't think it's vain at all, man. I think it's really humbling to be able to ask yourself that question because. Yeah, like I'm sure some part of you loved doing the podcast, but then it really called you home to the music and it's like you had to surrender something probably that you loved. Um, you know, mm. that wouldn't have been easy. Yeah. I do enjoy it because I feel like the, the format that I was using was quite interesting. Mm. And yeah. 
always loved listening back to it myself. You know, I always found myself listening to my own podcast a couple of times. Yeah. Which I thought, well, yeah. that's got to be a good sign. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. but yeah. Um, you know, I think one of the best things I ever learned or was reminded of is that when we're seeking or trying to find our purpose, mm. just to remember that everyone's purpose is the same and the the purpose is to be of service. Mm. It's just we have different ways of doing that. That's all. Mm-hmm. And so I think if I can rephrase what I said before about what I do with music, um, I would say that the music is my way that I am of service. And that's why it's my purpose. I love that. I love that, bro. <laughs> thank you so much, man. <laughs> um yeah thank you so much for being here today dropping in having this free-flowing chat (laughs) um but yeah man i it'd be rude of me to just say thanks for the moment like honestly it's a lifetime's of work that we get to sort of you know revel in and embellish upon and sort of dive deeper into and yeah man even just the the permission uh the permission slip that i know so many of us are taking away from this conversation to just be our raw vulnerable selves and also be kind to ourselves along that journey as well. So thank you so much for sharing yourself so openly, so vulnerably and the work you continue to yeah, just put into yourself to be who you are. Much love to you, <laughs> brother bear on behalf of myself and the inspired evolution tribe, wishing you all the best on your journey forward, man. No, it's been great. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thanks brother, man. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like, leave us a comment. And if you want to stay in tune for the new episodes launching every Monday, hit subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Stay inspired to evolve.